Often to the side of the Tala Vadya Kachari, a traditional Karnatic percussion ensemble performance, are the humble Konakol vocalists. <laughs> They recite a vocal rendering of the rhythms of a given composition using solkatu, a rhythm solfege language that was originally derived from the sounds of the merdangan drum. Young states that vocalists are seen as an extra rather than essential member of the percussion section. This has led to their diminishing presence in Karnatak kachari formats. Joyce says that some artists compromised on aesthetics and relied only on maths and technique leading to the genre's stigmatization as an elite intellectual art. These days, however, conical is flourishing as a solo vocal genre. Conical creates a special place for rhythmic expression and creativity to come to the fore, some reasons for which include their use in percussion pedagogy, their abstraction from instrumental timbres, and their connection with the voice and thereby dialogic forms of expression. Because this genre is ostensibly seen as highly intellectualized in Karnataka, Musicians from Bengaluru, colonially known as Bangalore, such as B.C. Manjunat, Somashakar Joyce and others, have taken to the internet as a means to share their artistry. Rather than diminishing the mathematical and thereby the supposedly not aesthetic aspects of the genre, they have focused on rhythmic complexity in their compositions and generated many innovative works that push Carnatic conceptions of rhythm to the extreme and explore rhythmic ideas outside the realms of classical Carnatic repertoire. These musicians are eager to share their work and process somewhere, if not at the Katsuri, the traditional concert performance. And so, the world of YouTube became their audience, where music nerds across the world can listen to, appreciate, and learn from their virtuosity. One such composition will be the focus of my discussion here. It was conceived of by B.C. Mantunat, a Mridangam player and Konakol artist based in Bengaluru, with a successful YouTube channel showcasing his rhythmic experiments. A particularly viral highlight is his performance using a thala derived from the proportions of the Fibonacci series. A transcription of this video performance went viral, 18 million views on Facebook. Who knew transcription was so popular? Joining him in the performance I'll analyse today is Varijasri Vanugopal, a younger generation Bengaluru-based singer who also has an exciting YouTube page. Their video is multi-tracked with a Zoom-style split window, and Varijasri learn listens to um, BC's part through an earphone as she records hers. Somewhat innovatively, rather than simply speaking the solkatu syllables, Varijasri sings them. Let's listen to the full performance and try to feel the beat if you can. Note that the counting is just to set the tempo. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Takadinatum, 
If you're listening to this for the first time, I imagine you struggled, as I did, to find a consistent beat and entrain to it. If you already know something, or even a lot about Carnatic musical concepts and Tala patterns, then you still might be confused about what's going on. In the video description, Manjunath says that he hopes we are all able to appreciate the intricacies and finesse behind this video. So that's what I will do now. My plan is to first analyse the performance as empirically as I can, using as few technical terms as possible. Second, I'll describe the rhythmic process using Carnatic terminology, um, incorporating interviews with the musicians to understand the problems with doing so. Third, I adopt a specifically designed analytical tool called GIS Met, developed by Robert Wells, adopting Western terminologies as needed. And finally, I problematize the differing representations of these rhythmic processes. So I'll start with a blow-by-blow -blow description of the piece's rhythmic processes as neutrally and empirically as I can, intentionally avoiding any particular jargon. Heard exactly 12 times throughout the piece, the musicians play a game-like pattern of claps and finger taps that forms a sequence of durations as follows. An attack that's four pulses long, an attack that's one pulse long. Two attacks separated by four pulses each, two attacks separated by one pulses each. 444111 etc up to 5 it may seem it seems intuitive to me to group these durations based on an expansion process 41 4411 444111 etc i use a time unit box system or tubs graph to visualize this showing the two different varieties of duration in different colors red and blue <clears throat> on adding these segments up we obtain a sequence of consecutive multiples of 5, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, which totals 75. Listening phenomenologically, there are 30 attacks, 10 are clapped and 20 are tapped with fingers and are thus not always audible, shown in different shades of orange. The lighter orange shows the fingered ones. <clears throat> On top of this, Varijasri sings the syllables, the five syllables, Tariginatom, each five times. The first time, each syllable is separated by five pulses, the second time by four, incrementally down to one, generating a sequence of interons at intervals as shown on screen. Again, it seems intuitive to base the, group these based on the reduction process, as I indicate with vertical lines. Adding within these groups, we get the same sequence of multiples of five, but in reverse order, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, which of course also adds to 75, and thus it finishes at exactly the same time as the clapping cycle, which lasts for about 13.8 seconds. When the clapping sequence repeats for the first time, Mandunat begins reciting, except each of his durations have doubled compared to Varijasri's solo opening. Now they are 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8 etc. Naturally, doing so results in this new durational process taking up two cycles worth of the clapping pattern. Simultaneously, Varijastri begins the same doubled material, but after a short delay of five pulses. She alternates evenly with Manjunat, um, until the last attack separated by ten pulses. Were she to maintain the exact attack separation of Manjunat's part, as if in exact canon, she would no longer alternate evenly, and so she drops one pulse off her last syllable. The removal of a pulse between the last syllable of each of the five lines shown here allows her to finish at the same time as Manjunat, compensating for her delay of five pulses. <clears throat> We're now up to the fourth clapping cycle, and Manjunat and Varijasri converge to a unison. 
They sing the original durational pattern, each syllable separated by five pulses, then four, then three, then two, then one, except they sing each of these three times, which, because what has essentially happened is that every uh, proportion has been tripled, takes three cycles of the 75 pulse clapping cycle to complete. This accounts for the first six of 12 clapping cycles. <clears throat> for the next half of the piece, they sing phrases worth nine pulses, eight pulses, seven pulses, etc., down to, down to three. These reductions are created by removing one syllable from each phrase. At first, each of these phrases are sung three times each, first by Manjunat, then by Varijasri, then together. This reduction process lasts for 126 pulses, and so to a finish aligned with the clapping cycle, they then sing a new nine pulse phrase three times, this time embedded with the syllables used in the first half of the piece, ta dim ta diginatom. They also repeat this triple phrase three times, except each repetition is separated by an intervening tam tam tam. This process totals 99 pulses, and as you can see, 126 pulses plus 99 pulses comes out at 225, which lasts exactly three of the 75 pulse clapping cycles, taking up seven, cycles 7 through 9. Following this, they sing the same 9876543 reducing phrase pattern, except now only reciting each of them twice, alternating between Vadijasri and Manjunath. This takes up 84 pulses, and left over there are 66 pulses before the next clapping cycle begins. This is filled with another triple phrase repetition, also using the syllables used in the first half of the piece, Tariganathom, except there is an extra pulse added after di, uh, which generates a six pulse phrase, Tadiginathom. They repeat this triple phrase three times, now with only two thams intervening between each repetition. These two processes together last for two clapping cycles, 10 and 11. For the 12th and final cla uh, clapping cycle, they recite the same reducing phrases in unison only once each, lasting 42 pulses. This leaves a remaining 33 pulses before the end of the clapping cycle. Uh, and continuing on the same idea of thrice repeating some phrase containing tadiginatom, they squeeze in three repetitions by doubling the rate of pulsation for the first four of those syllables, making for an exciting climactic ending. These triply repeated phrases are themselves performed three times, now with only one tham intervening between each repetition. Tariganatom, 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 tham, tariganatom, 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 tham, etc. Now this might seem like an inefficient explanation if you know anything about Carnatic terminology. Practically all of the rhythmic processes I have just described have specific names, and even if I used some Western terminologies, this piece could be described a little more efficiently. In this case, however, I adopted vocabulary such as pulse and cycle in a neutral way, thereby imbuing those terms with a certain expansiveness, hoping to demonstrate that a word such as cycle can be an umbrella term for a broad range of epistemologies of temporal organization, such as meter or tala, each, which each come with their own uh, baggage. <clears throat> Additionally, this choice of words brings a certain simplicity to the analysis I just performed, making a very complex piece at least somewhat comprehensible to initiates. Moving on for now, I attempt to create a Carnatic description of the piece. In Indian classical music, a tala is simply a rhythmic cycle that is usually enacted by a codified sequence of hand gestures that have a long history of theorization dating back at least 2,000 years to the Nartriya Shastra and have been institutionalized by various systems over the last five centuries. While it seems there has always been a certain degree of flexibility with tala construction, the 35 tala system shown here standardized the talas, and today the big four tala account for the vast majority of the tala, uh, of compositions, with Adi tala, shown here, um, comprising around 80% of all Carnatic song repertoire. So how do the established Indian tala theories explain what's going on here? Well, one cycle of a given tala is called avarta, or avartanam. Within the tala we expect to see beats called aksara, each marked by different kriya, or hand gestures. The sequence of kriya in any given tala is, to my understanding, the primary identifying feature, over and above the cardinality of the cycle. I show this here by organizing the 35 talas according to number, as opposed to the ordering of the shlokas from which they are derived. 
which reveals the un somewhat unsystematic nature of them from a numerological perspective, um, showing that the understanding that understanding thalas from this perspective is not an emic one. This is because the sequence of kriya in a given thala is constructed from combinations of anga, groups of variable lengths beginning with a clap. Anga combinations generate cardinalities that are simply the result of the anga concatenation process, or as David Nelson says, quote, one might describe them as assembled rather than derived from the movements of the human body, e.g. marches and dances, that char characterize European meters. Because of this, uh, there are avarta cardinalities that do not exist within this anga system, and some cardinalities can be achieved using a variety of possible anga configurations. For example, there are four seven-beat meters that are generatable. Each akshara within um, a thala can be equally divided by imposing a gati subdivision of practically any cardinality, the units of which are known as matra. <coughs> In this case, the kriya form an irregular sequence that does not mark out a steady akshara or beat. From the perspective of the blue kriya, the fours, one could call each of the pulses that separates them matra, the subdivision, and assume that this piece is adopting chatusragathi, the vision into four. But from this viewpoint, the presence of the red events, um, which are valid kriya too, lie on pulse positions outside the steadiness expected of aksara, and also shift the blue events respectively. Additionally, for almost the entirety of the piece, the red kriya are not divided into matra themselves, which is unconventional given the usual role that kriya have in marking out aksara beats and containing matra. This terminological confusion is in part created by the built-in top-down conception of pulse hierarchy. Beats come first, then you divide them into smaller parts. Additionally, it is unclear where our anger groups should be, whether beginning on every clap or every iteration of this expansion process. The problem, as identified here in an interview with Manjunat, is that the Thala is engaging with two levels of pulse stream, which not only confuses the identification of Aksara and Matra, but also Anga. This Thala that we have done does not come into any kind of uh, Thala systems that we have yeah. in Karnatic. It's completely made up and it has, you cannot describe the Angas here. Anga, normally you don't have the Anga with two different speeds. This is totally out of any system that you might want to look into in Carnatic music. One clue to identify possible angas in this innovative context is given in cycles three and four of the piece. Mandunat performs the Tala as usual, but Varijashri performs the Tala in reverse. There are a few logical ways I can see to reverse this pattern. For example, reversing every single Kriya, or beginning every group beginning with a clap. Um, but her choice here reflects one particular segmentation based on the larger expansion process. She takes what was the largest group, 444441111, and performs this first, rather than last, and then the remaining four similarly segmented groups in reverse order, as shown with arrows. This segmentation could arguably be the anger in this scenario, although it ignores the usual consideration of claps indicating the beginning of a new anger. In cycle 5, they switch roles and Manjunath performs the reversed version and Varijasri the regular. Another reason to divide th this Tala into Anga as indicated here is that when asked about his compositional process, Manjunath reveals the importance of the number 5 and that the cardinality of the cycle was an incidental result of the process. It's also interesting to note that he uses the term 16th note here to refer to the fastest pulse bypassing the confusion surrounding Aksara and Matra. I think, I think it was the pattern that really uh, interested me. Right. And then you could have gone for infinite clapping, right. but we had to stop somewhere. Uh -huh. And then five is very, very important number in Carnatic music. Yeah. So I thought, okay, Tadigina Tum, the, the five syllables was good enough to stop there. Mm -hmm. And then when I counted, then it turned out to be 75, 16 notes. But uh, I only realized that after composing the whole piece because it was i didn't know that it was 75 16 until mm -hmm. i finished the piece then when i was trying to write something about the piece i was like okay let me check how many 16 notes these are right and it came up to 75. 
Looking now at formal features, I've mapped out the overall structure of the piece using the Thaler cycles as a base unit. In this diagram, it is apparent that the piece's expanding then contracting structure generates a precise mridangam yati, a structure named after the inverse hourglass shape of the mridangam drum. The first half of the piece features the structure known as purvanga, which refers to the repeated utterance of a string of syllables, tirmana, each with equal pulse separation, and on each repetition, the interonset intervals are incrementally reduced. This reduction generates a gopuchayati, a cow's tail shape. Remarkably, the thalas simultaneously has an expanding structure known as srotavahamyati, meaning river-shaped. The rhythmic misalignments created by these structures interacting in this 75 pulse framework are very complex, as the tub score illustrates, and as I will go into later. Also intriguing in the first half of the piece is that these reduction phrases are doubled and tripled to create a meta srotavahamyati, out of gopuchayati. The second half of the piece is a korve, identified by its intricately calculated or kanraku construction, followed by a precisely placed mora, the typical cadential construction of a triply repeated phrase akin to the Hindustani tihai. The korve's basic proportion is repeated three times, beginning with a tripled form, then a doubled form, then a single, creating a meta gopuchati. The first half of, the, of each section of the korvai themselves features a gopuchayati shape, thus this structural shape occurs at two levels of the form. Speaking of recurrence between formal levels, the moras in this piece are another example. Each mora here is an example of what David Nelson calls a compound mora. In this case, they are of the form 3p, k, 3p, k, 3p, where one mora phrase itself contains three phrases, p, um, and is performed three times, each separated by a karve, k, a short buffer between each repetition. Then, at the highest level of the form, there are three moras, albeit with slightly differing dimensions and exact syllabic content. Nevertheless, they are clearly related, as their total pulse values are 99, 66, and 33 respectively, creating yet another level of gopuchayati. Um, and each mora contains the syllables tadiginatom, as pointed out earlier, creating thematic consistency throughout the piece. This discussion in Carnatic terms may be overwhelming for those not familiar with Carnatic music theory, and it has the advantage of conveying a better sense of an emic hearing, Carnatic conceptions of meter, and design elements. However, the limitations of conventional terminological usage actually create some confusion here, even for Manjunath, who warned against the identification of Angas in this instance. Now, each of the analyses presented thus far captures the linear durational processes, identifies formal elements, and picks apart the various rhythmic strands individually. But each fails to capture the experience of listening to the piece as a whole, with the two rhythmic strands, Solkatu and Tala, interacting vertically which feels like a jolty, bumpy ride with claps and syllables interrupting expected pulse streams every which way. To articulate this aspect of the piece, I will adopt an analytical tool known as Generalized Interval System MET. Based on the work of David Lewin, GIS MET consists of a few mathematical functions performed on two metric layers, X and Y, that reveal how a given Y layer shifts in relation to X. Developed by Robert Wells, he primarily used it for analysing metric conflict in Franz Liszt's piano music. When applying the tool to Liszt, Wells assigns X to the measure, and Y for some rhythmic surface layer that is in conflict with the measure. Each of these begins with X or Y downbeats. Following on from this work, some of Wells' other publications have demonstrated how one might apply this to Carnatic music. However, uh, measure and downbeat are not suitable terms for describing the metric experience of Carnatic music, given the orality of Carnatic musical practice and the lack of metric stress, as in Western notated music. To combat this issue, Wells simply defines the X layer as, as broadly as possible. Um, he calls it the referential cognitively internalized metric layer, which he equates with Thala. In the more conventional cases that Wells demonstrates, this is a fair assumption that yields efficacious results. However, as we've seen, this composition is far from conventional. Firstly, some of Wells' operations require a constant X meter, 
but as demonstrated earlier, this piece of style engages with two pulse streams, and thereby then negates the feeling of a constant akshara or beat. Additionally, as identified here in the following explanation by um, Manjunath, the normal feeling of Thala as a referential, cognitively internalized metric layer is not the case here. Rather, there is the reversed relationship between Thala and Solkatu. The protagonist of the whole piece is the Thala, not the singing or saying. We had to let go one element that is singing and saying in our, in our conscious mind, you know, because it was already in our subconscious mind. Normally what happens is we kind of sing to our conducting. But I think it was a reverse method here where we, where we were conducting to our singing. This ethnographic evidence suggests adopting a different approach to the way that Wells demonstrates, instead assigning the X layer to the solkatu, which the musicians appear to have internalized instead of the tala. Put another way, here the solkatu is being used as a reference for the more irregular durations of the tala. So this is what I came up with. I'll use green box uh, to identify the elements of this diagram as I introduce them. At the bottom, I've notated the sol, kattu, and tala in uh, rhythms in green and orange, respectively. After some tests, I decided that the best results came when I assigned each syllable to be one X measure. So they are shown in green boxes there. I use measure here not to refer to um, any kind of notational division, but simply to remain consistent with Wells's terminology. First, I identified pulse locations called met time points, based on the thala's total length of 75 pulses. This step is simply used for calculations and does not really show anything interesting. Second, I used the met time points to calculate the intervals, um, which is where interesting things begin to happen. The first number in each of the sets of brackets communicates how many X measures or green boxes have passed. However, due to the incrementally reducing size of an X measure caused by the Purvanga structure, it became apparent that I needed to keep track of the changes of duration. Uh, so I've done that here using colors, um, which indicate the given, uh, where a given number of X measures is of a given duration, as shown in the little key. Um, the second number in the brackets indicates the number of Y measures, which, given that we are always referring to the beginning of a new Unga group in the Thala, is always one. Um, the third number in the brackets is the most interesting, and it shows the Y downbeat shift relative to the X meter. Again, downbeat here does not refer to any kind of metric stress, it simply refers to some beginning. I'm simply using it for consistency with Wells' terminology. This is where the misalignments between Solkatu and Tala can be systematically tracked. For the first two met intervals, here and here, the third number is zero, because as you can see, the first three beginning, unga beginnings, orange boxes, align with some solkatu syllable in green boxes. However, by the third interval, the third number shows a shift of plus one, indicating that the beginnings of the two layers have gone out of sync by one pulse. Referring to the tubs notation, the fourth orange box is now lagging behind the green pulse by one. Moving um, forward, the next interval um, also shows a plus one as the third bracketed value. This is because the mechanics of MET show us only the shift relative to the last Y position. However, in looking at the tubs notation, we see that the orange box is now two pulses after the last green solkatu attack. To show this greater shift relative to the solkatu, I calculated a cumulative Y downbeat shift at each new interval, shown above here. Um, as indicated by a red circle, now this shift that was apparent from the tubs notation drops out in the numbers. This whole process leads to a hasty-esque listening of the piece, where we note events as being early or delayed relative to our expectations. However, by using GIS Met, we can quantify precisely how much a given attack shifts relative to the supposedly stable metric layer. Let's listen to the first cycle to see how it has enriched your understanding of the interaction between rhythmic layers. I'll now briefly reflect on these representations and the process I've undertaken here. By attempting to describe the piece as neutrally and as jargon-free as possible, 
I believe that this piece's intricate design may be appreciated by non-specialists and place the piece in a broader context of a constellation of metric epistemologies. However, it is rather long-winded and verbose, um, despite using simple ter terminology. It also doesn't necessarily capture a Carnatic hearing of the piece. The Carnatic description's strongest attribute is that it conveys an emic understanding of the piece. To an outsider, however, it can be difficult to feel the differing conceptions of metre at a first glance, and the overload of Carnatic terminology does little to help. Additionally, this piece's innovative structure escapes a clean-cut analysis. Bringing in ethnographic material here helped to solve some of the issues. Robert Wells' analytical tool GIS Met, once tweaked to work for this piece, brings out aspects of the vertical dimension of this piece's temporal experience that failed to be captured by either preceding analysis. However, it does so with perhaps daunting mathematical formalisms that need to be evaluated further in the case of this complex repertoire item. Finally, this two and a half minute piece's unexpected rhythmic experiences yielded exceptionally rich possibilities for analysis and theorization from many perspectives. This highlights the continued importance of close analysis in the development of music theories of any kind, even though with today's technology, uh, statistical analysis of a corpus of works becomes increasingly feasible. This piece would be an outlier by most measures, and yet it suggests many theoretical outcomes and begs for a detailed explanation. Thank you for listening and on screen shown my references and other things.